Good evening all, I'm Hina Goswami, Editorial Consultant with IGPP, Institute for Governance, Policies and Politics, New Delhi. It is a pleasure to welcome each of you to this enlightening panel discussion on artificial intelligence and healthcare, opportunities, challenges and ethical considerations. This discussion is a crucial component of the broader emerging technologies and AI, governance and policy landscape initiative led by IGPP. Our mission with this initiative is to actively engage in the shaping of AI regulation with a commitment to fostering the development of robust, adaptable, and organic frameworks that ensure the efficacy and sustainability of artificial intelligence. Embracing a multifaceted approach, our initiative places emphasis on awareness, collaboration, and innovation drawing insights from diverse stakeholders, such as lawmakers, industry experts, researchers, and social scientists. Today's panel discussion represents a key facet of this initiative to discuss the impact of AI in healthcare. Healthcare is one of the most critical sectors and is highly regulated because it concerns the lives of individuals. Several perspectives are defining the AI integration into healthcare, prompting questions on whether AI will serve as a complementary tool or a replacement. The questions of data privacy, patient security, equity, and fairness needs careful examination. Bias in AI algorithms for healthcare can have catastrophic consequences by propagating deeply rooted societal biases. This can uh, result in misdiagnosing certain patient groups like gender and ethnic minorities that have a history of being underrepresented in existing data sets, further amplifying inequalities. It is pertinent to talk about these issues say, shaping the integration of AI in healthcare. And today on this panel discussion, we are joined by Dr. Shatir Jadav, Assistant Professor, Koita Center for Digital Health, IIT Bombay. Dr. Kirti Bhushan Pradhan, Senior Health Advisor, and Ms. Karnika Seth, Cyber Law Expert and Founder, Seth Associates. I welcome you all to this panel discussion. So I'll uh, start with Dr. Shatij. Uh, from your perspective, what are some of the most impactful and promising application of AI in healthcare today? And how do you foresee them evolving in the near future? Yeah, thank, thank you for the question. So uh, there are particular themes under which uh, there are really nice AI solutions coming up in healthcare. So one very important thing that is coming up is uh, personalized medicine. So what happens is uh, if you look at uh, certain disease conditions, right? For example, if you look at patients with chronic kidney disease, for example, there are certain sets of individuals who actually uh, stay at the same stage and do not progress very fast towards requirement of renal replacement therapy. Right? There are certain individuals who actually accelerate towards requirement of renal replacement therapy. The same thing happens with diabetes, right? There are certain individuals who stay in a very controlled diabetic state, but certain individuals actually accelerate faster. And these, while traditional medicine actually um, labels, just puts just one label to a diagnosis, right? The patient is a diabetic or a patient has chronic kidney disease. There's a lot of heterogeneity. There's a lot of heterogeneity within the group with smaller homogeneous subgroups. And each individual actually responds differently to the particular treatment. So with the huge data analytics that is happening now, uh, with a large amount of data, especially multimodal data, right? You can take image, text, and take clinical data as well, put together. Um, personalized medicine will become one very important theme in the future. So that is one, I think, for sure. Second is predictive analysis, right? To determine which patient will respond to treatment as compared to which patient will not respond to treatment. This is crucially important, right? So there's one project that we are doing right now with Tata Memorial Hospital, where we want to determine which patient of Hodgkin's lymphoma will respond to treatment A as compared to treatment B. Because then you can actually... Given the resource constraints of the country that we live in, right, uh, we should be able to deliver a specific treatment to a specific individual, which we know has high probability of success. So this is another way of predictive analyzing which patient will respond. And uh, you cannot stay away from large language models, right? Chat GPT is here and similar other things are here. Virtual assistants are going to be a big thing. And uh, what we were talking about previously, taking away the treasury of uh, work, 
will be a big role these virtual assistants, virtual health assistants will take. So that the cognitive load of the doctors is actually reduced so that they are more focused on most important decisions. So these three things, predictive analysis, uh, second is personalized medicine, and third is virtual health assistants are going to be very crucial in the future. Dr. Keithi, while the uh, prospects of AI in healthcare in India look promising, what is the current status of uh, application of AI in healthcare sector today in India? So today, uh, AI has been used for cancer screening, for uh, diabetic retinopathy, eye care, and of course, the, the radiology part of it. But for me, AI, I'm going to see kind of making a revolutionary kind of help to the Indian health system, where our governments have tried all kind of ways and strategies how to place uh, qualified, skilled doctors, nurses, technicians in the rural India, and which have not been successful. It started with penalizing government trained doctors, nurses, technicians, pharmacists to go to the rural areas. That didn't work. Then they started incentivizing that those who serve rural areas will be incentivized. That didn't work. So the only solution and hope I have is technology, which will have no ifs and buts. You take it wherever it will go. And the most important thing is today when we analyze our health system, our crisis is congestion at the tertiary, whatever limited tertiary healthcare facilities we have. Too much of congestion, too much of overload, because we are not doing anything at the primary care level. So as a result, the minor health issues are becoming catastrophic health issues, larger health issues, and landing up at the tertiary care. So my analysis is AI is going to help us in a big way in early detection, early referral, and probably early intervention, and which will have a guaranteed solution because of the early detection. And AI is, is going to play a major role. That's what the, the savior, which is going to come, which other methods, other strategies have not worked till date in many states of India. Ms. Karnika, whenever we talk about uh, AI, two issues that are paramount and that come up in every discussion related to AI are data security, data privacy and security and especially when we talk about uh, a sector such as healthcare what are the uh, challenges that you see in using ai technology in the healthcare uh, sector regarding data privacy privacy and security and what approaches do you think are would be most effective to ensure that you know we make the best use of AI technology without compromising on the privacy or uh, privacy of the patients? Right. So very pertinent question indeed. Uh, when we see AI in healthcare, uh, USD 1.6 billion or so is the market by 2025. That's uh, studies have indicated. And uh, while it has a huge potential in almost every sector, Healthcare especially, it has a big role to play. And we've all seen that footprint already develop, uh, whether it is, uh, you know, telemedicine or uh, predictive, uh, you know, diagnosis, analysis, um, personalized, uh, you know, advice uh, to patients, uh, the data which is collected from, uh, you know, all our uh, IoT devices, wearable, you know, devices as well. We see... Um, a trend is towards not only therapies, treatments, but also uh, increasingly, you know, maintaining their, uh, for example, ultrasound radiology reports or accessibility, reduced cost efficiencies of scale. Uh, they are uh, definitely very promising indeed. But uh, the flip side of it is, yes, concerns, which especially the legal concerns when we say privacy and security, as you rightly pointed out. For that, we have new laws in the country, uh, you know, on the lines of EU, uh, like in EU, we have GDPR in Europe. 
Similarly, in India, we have the Digital Personal Data Protection Bill, which has recently been enacted. Now, uh, it has almost on the similar pattern of uh, GDPR, requirements of notice consent. So unless and until a patient gives voluntary consent after reading the notice, what information is collected from the patient, why it is being collected, uh, is it being uh, you know collected only to the extent which is necessary, and how it's going to be stored, how it's going to be processed, uh, till when will it be retained? All these questions are to be addressed in the notice itself. And once there is an express consent of the patient, only then can you proceed with the data. So therefore, there has there is an increased level of accountability, privacy uh, is going to be protected because of the transparency involved in the whole process of taking consent. And not only that, uh, privacy is looked into, but also the security part. So all the data, especially critical data, like healthcare records, they have to be maintained very, very strictly uh, as per protocols. Uh, I'm sure there are also uh, requirements of, for example, ISO 27001 is one standard, but beyond that in GDPR, we see a lot of encryption being used, a lot of storage by uh, pseudonization, uh, and a lot of other technical measures that can be adopted to secure the data. So the, the responsibility in, of monitoring, the responsibility of a consent manager in the first place, a data protection officer, uh, wherever it's applicable, is, is, is heightened. And the CTO, the chief technology officer, needs to take into account all these compliances in order to protect the privacy and ensure that it's the dead data which is collected and processed is secure. So these are the key highlights, and uh, you know this is something which is the data protection authority is going to be looking into the administration of the this uh, bill, you know, and the act now, the DPDP, and it has very stringent liabilities, almost up to two hundred crores in some cases. So it's not something which is going to be easy um, a way out. It's a, it's something which requires compliance and can't be overlooked anymore, uh, even in the Indian context. So having advice, you know, some companies on healthcare sector, especially, we've seen uh, that we have tried to comply with all these DPDP requirements. And, you know, the nine judge bench of our Supreme Court in the justice case, Puttaswami case has held that the right to privacy is a fundamental right of every citizen. So unless there is an exemption uh, given in the act itself and for or by the statutory authority, you know, for some justifiable reasons, there is no excuse to compliance. So therefore, all the terms and conditions, all the notice and consent requirements, even in the online space, the telemedicine uh, websites or apps, app stores, which give all these uh, you know facilities or services, they ought to comply with the terms of uh, conditions and the privacy policies in compliance with the law of the land. So therefore, we have tried to do the same. And while we store the data, while we preserve the data, we ensure all these technologies which are required to safeguard the information are kept uh, intact. You know, they are they are duly adopted. That's how we look at this law. Yeah, and that's how we protect the privacy and security. Now I open this question to both uh, Dr. Kirti and Dr. Shatij. Um, you know, in India, if you look at the healthcare landscape today, there are two tires. One are the expensive private uh, hospitals, which provide the best care, the best treatment, right? But they are not affordable, accessible for everybody. While on the other hand, we have government uh, hospitals, uh, which are really affordable, really good doctors, but... Uh, you know, more can be done about the infrastructure or the administration, how they are run and hygiene and such issues. So how do we ensure that when we are adopting this new AI technology, we do not take forward the existing inequalities of in the society and especially in the healthcare landscape forward? Here, the interesting part is actually technology does not differentiate between rich, poor, men, women, rural, urban. That's the beauty of it. Whereas a human being can have biases, can have judgments based on personality, based on uh, men, women, child, adult, rural, urban, and all that. So that's the beauty of this technology. So that itself, by default, is maintaining kind of a equity. That, that, that's one part. 
The second part, coming back to the tertiary care or the private care in the cities versus the rural hospitals or rural public health centers, in my view, the Indian rich, we need not think kind of a lot about their issues. The Indian rich can afford healthcare anywhere. And there are plenty of choices in my analysis. Whereas the lower class, bottom of the pyramid, lower middle class, the missing middle, that's the crux. We don't have much choices for them. The choices are either the public facilities or the charitable health centers. There are many charitable, non, non-profit health centers, which also caters to the healthcare services beyond government. So in that case, the only challenge which I can see today, most of the rural centers are actually very well equipped with equipment because governments have plenty of money, it beat mining fund. I'm sure people are aware about district mineral fund. Even the poorest districts of India have thousands of crores lying in their bank accounts at the district level and which is supposed to be utilized for that district. So money is not an issue. And when money is not an issue, they're able to buy equipment, build infrastructure very easily. The only challenge which they're facing today is not able to attract quality human resources in healthcare. And for me, probably the technology is the savior. And technology will build the bridge and will avoid the equity issue, which we have been talking a lot about in the past. And Globally also, also that has been an issue. So that's the way I would put it, that technology will be the savior and bridge the equity gap. Yeah, so just uh, adding up, uh, adding on the top of what uh, Dr. Tadhan has said, right? Uh, so uh, it is it is actually a very interesting point that he brought up that uh, one of the problems that we have in the rural healthcare is that you're not able to attract sufficient human resource, right? Or retain sufficient human resource, right? And the government has tried many things and potentially nothing has worked. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, telemedicine is a very good example how this has been handled, right? And you might be aware of this uh, uh, nonprofit uh, 10-bit ICU. I work very closely with them and they have a very nice uh, telemedicine setup where the, there is a hub and spoke pattern and the hub actually has the uh, clinicians in place and the spokes are where the hospitals are, which are very well equipped. But uh, uh, the hub doctors are actually through telemedicine being able to treat the spoke, doc- uh, spoke patients with local support of nurses, trained, really good trained nurses. So this is um, one way of looking, uh, looking how technology is trying to help. Uh, but the accessibility issue continues to be there, right? One specific problem is language, right? Uh, uh, almost all AI solutions are developed in English, right? And uh, Indian, lang- Indian language adaption in the AI space is slowly improving. Uh, there's a lot of work going on from the government. So it shows that the government is very aware. Bashni is a very big project that the government has actually instituted where uh, Indian specific language uh, data is being collected and then translations are being available, which could be then utilized into AI solutions. Um, also, um, the disparity actually comes from absence of diverse data points to study AI, right? So like for a, any AI solution, you require data sets and very diverse data sets. So there's a very nice uh, quick story that I'll tell you. Um, so there was this... Uh, company in the West that produced, developed an algorithm uh, to determine CT scan nodules, chest, chest nodules, right? And they developed it on the uh, Western data. And then they piloted it in India. And suddenly uh, they did a small screening and they saw that there are too many chest nodules now in every Indian population, which is way beyond what is expected. And uh, then, then they realized that uh, in India, tuberculosis is very endemic. And almost everybody is infected potentially with having these granulomatous lesions, which look like nodules. And now these became false positives and everybody, their algorithm started picking up everything. So targeted 
targeted research is what something is very crucial to address the problem that you asked at the beginning, right? Uh, the problems of the rich potentially are very different as compared to problems of the um, uh, lower part of the pyramid. And we need to do more targeted work towards it with solutions targeted to solve those, those problems. So this is how I could put, put uh, my thoughts. Uh, Ms. Kanika, you have already pointed out some that the government has made uh, stringent laws to ensure that, you know, uh, healthcare bodies are complying to the privacy laws that the government is making. Uh, but there's also one problem in healthcare sectors that there are far too many bodies for approval of medical devices or drugs, and even there's a certification of doctors to practice. So when AI is used for diagnosis, treatment, or prescription, what legal challenges might occur? And uh, do you think we would have a different body now to oversee AI, how AI is used in uh, healthcare sectors? Or are there already existing laws and regulatory architecture uh, that can cover that um, concern? We've had round tables. We've had discussions on the Digital India Act also uh, with the Honorable Chief, like uh, Minister for IT. And uh, in Aspadi, um, you know, Honorable Minister Chandrasekhar you also, we are going to have the DIA Act, which is uh, going to have you know, regulation for high risk systems. Now, whether healthcare will be also certain systems will be under those high risk systems, it, it's likely to be because uh, obviously the kind of sensitivity of data that is collected uh, is high in uh, in those cases. Also in the cases of, you know, where the collection of biometrics is there or uh, healthcare records and I would say even facial recognition technology to some extent will involve sensitive data. So whether when it comes to specifically healthcare sector, I feel that this would be under a sensitive uh, you know, parameter and high-risk systems would need proper regulation. Um, the general uh, trend as on date is whenever there is a general law, there is a special law. Obviously, if there's an inconsistency, the special law prevails over the general law. So in that case, uh, even in the healthcare sector, if there are some sectoral laws which have to be complied with, then those specific laws will need to be complied with. The the in issue which is involved here is to avoid to the maximum extent possible any inconsistency so that they all can be harmoniously read together. Uh, obviously, the objective of the acts uh, and the laws is uh, in furtherance of the interests of the public. So we'll have to keep that object in mind when we understand and interpret the law. So uh, when the actual, uh, you know, final uh, footprint or blueprint rather of the same will come to play when once we have the DIA Act you know, enacted and uh, there will be clear provisions to regulate those high risk systems. So we can comment on that better then. But um, having said that, it is a very clear emphasis on maintaining ethical standards and considerations uh, whenever there's the data which is being collected, specifically processed with AI or uh, even, uh, you know, any kind of assessments or analytics or diagnosis done through AI. So when it comes to transparency, accountability, or human oversight, uh, you know, removing the black box syndrome, uh, having no op opacity, and those kind of issues which are ethical considerations, trust, reliability, security, privacy. These are going to be the pivotal, I would say, principles which will take shape. And even Niti Aayog has given the same uh, endorsement to these principles. And we find this uh, also accepted in OECD or uh, even UNESCO or other you know, bodies. So this is something that is uh, universally, almost universally accepted principles of ethics in uh, use of AI. So I, I find that even our laws are going to imbibe the same principles. And uh, having said that, the final uh, outcome will obviously be, be, be clearer with uh, the new DIA Act being enacted. But uh, we may need a specific law very soon on AI rather than just having the DIA Act and a few provisions on high risk systems being regulated is my personal view. Uh, Dr. Shitich, uh, when we seek medical assistance, trust also forms an important part uh, of the whole process. Like... Uh, 
foundation of our interaction with a doctor. So can this concept of trust be extended to AI systems within the healthcare domain? Uh, it's a it's a very interesting question, uh, a bit difficult to answer, but maybe a twofold answer might be. I'll try to do justice to it. So, uh, actually, trust uh, comes through explainability, right? Um, and uh, what happens in AI solutions in general, and healthcare in particular, is that uh, an answer is given, right? But the why is missing most of the time. And as soon as, and that, that's what uh, uh, Ms. Karnika also was talking about, the black box situation, right? Where there's a, there's a, there's a response from the AI system, uh, but there's no explainability there. there the why is absent. And uh, there's a lot of maneuvering that then researchers and even implementers try to do is they try to put in explainability post hoc. But actually explainability by design should be very important. Right. Um, when, uh, when you develop solutions, the explainability has to be inbuilt into the system. So explainability is very, very crucial, um, especially in this era of large language models. Right. Uh, uh, we have been actually trying to work on, on this domain from a research perspective also as to how to bring in explainability in the medical domain uh, from a large language model perspective uh, when you are when that model is asked medical questions. Right. And the second actually is uh, the AI solution should not be the whole and soul and the final outcome. There has to be human oversight, something that Ms. Karnika again pointed to. Uh, the human in the loop system is very crucial. The final signing authority, the final deciding authority has to be the human, has to be the medical expert. And uh, this will, so then the role is not AI, role of AI is to only be an assistive technology to in the decision making for the doctor and not be the final decision making authority. So these two will actually bring in a lot of trust. Thank you.